Good afternoon. Welcome, everybody. Um, I'm Amy Seawright. I'm the new director for Southeast Asia here at CSIS, and this is my first official function, and it's a real pleasure for me to be able to introduce Ambassador Ted Osius, who is here with us from Hanoi, and he's going to talk with us today about the very historic visit that President Obama just concluded in Vietnam. Um, Ambassador Osius is a longtime friend of CSIS. Um, he was sworn in as U.S. Ambassador in Vietnam in December 2014. He served previously as Associate Professor at the National War College from 2013 to 2014, and as a Senior State Department Visiting Fellow at the Center for Strategic and International Studies here from 2012 to 2013. He's a career diplomat uh, and has served as Deputy Chief of Mission in the U.S. Embassy in Jakarta, Indonesia. And um, he also has had previous postings in India, the Philippines, Thailand, and Vietnam. So with that, I will turn things over to Ambassador Osius, who um, will give some remarks. And then uh, Murray Hebert will moderate the following discussion. Thank you. Me and congratulations on your new position. Uh, I want to also say thank you to Murray. This is my vacation, and only Murray could have pulled me away from my vacation. Sorry about that. Uh, no, uh, because you are who you are, I'm, I'm really happy to be here. Uh, I'm going to uh, tell you about something that is actually usually very turgid and bureaucratic and boring, which is a joint statement. Um, and we don't tend to like joint statements because they are bureaucratic and boring. But let me tell you two reasons why I think it's worth taking a look at the joint statement that our two presidents issued uh, during the visit that was just completed. One is that uh, in, the, in the Vietnamese system, it's very important. It was read aloud word for word on national television. Uh, when I have traveled throughout Vietnam, after the general secretary's very important visit here last year, uh, I have had joint statements quoted back at me, word, line by line, by provincial officials in Vietnam. They are taken very, very seriously in Vietnam. Those are people's marching orders going forward when they think about what the relationship is supposed to encompass. And on our side, uh, I think it's a really good catalog of what we were able to accomplish in recent times in the relationship uh, since the comprehensive partnership was established. Uh, it, it demonstrates that the relationship is very quickly broadening and deepening. So I'm going to walk you through it just a little bit, and then uh, very happy to take questions on whatever you like. Uh, we started out by, by uh, noting that we had uh, come to agreement on a package of assistance that will, that will help Vietnam uh, fulfill all of its commitments under TPP. And that is, we didn't actually attach a number to it uh, because TPP has not yet been ratified by Vietnam's National Assembly, but the Vietnamese told us in every single meeting that they are committed to ratifying TPP quickly and then implementing all of their commitments completely. Uh, we also, uh, under the, the rubric of economic collaboration, we were able to sign a number of commercial agreements. Three were signed in the uh, presence of the president. They totaled $16 billion. One of them, a sale of 100 Boeing airplanes to Vietjet, is the equivalent of 61,000 jobs in the United States. There were quite a number of other commercial deals that were signed at a separate event. We were able, in the realm of people-to-people -people ties to establish Fulbright University Vietnam, the first independent, not-for-profit, American-style university in Vietnam. We were able, after 12 years of negotiations, to agree to send the Peace Corps to Vietnam. And we were able to get an agreement to extend visas for Americans to one-year uh, multiple entry, which I hope will make a lot of people's lives a lot simpler. Uh, the, the president, and this got a lot of attention, uh, the president announced a uh, full lift of the lethal weapons ban, which removed an historic obstacle to full normalization of the relationship. 
uh, and also announced uh, our commitment to uh, stepping up security collaboration, especially in the maritime realm under the Maritime Security Initiative. Uh, we also were able to announce an agreement with the Ministry of National Defense and the Ministry of Transportation on how we could collaborate when it came to natural disasters in the region. Prepositioning supplies in a place where they can be used by anyone in the region uh, to deal with a uh, natural disaster, but in Vietnam at a place where a port and, a, and an airport come close together. And we agreed on a, a process for training Vietnamese peacekeepers and inaugurated a, a peacekeeping training center. Uh, we also agreed to follow up on the collaboration that we've had in Da Nang in dioxin cleanup and to partner on cleaning up a, a bigger hotspot, uh, which is the Bien Hoa Air Base. We also, uh, in the joint statement itself, we, uh, we received a commitment from the Vietnamese to do what they've already stated they, would, they are committed to doing, which is bring their laws into sync with the 2013 Constitution uh, when it comes to certain uh, elements of, a, uh, of uh, uh, I would say, public engagement. So the law on religion and belief and the law and association in particular, the Vietnamese made public commitments to, uh, to pursue the uh, rewriting of those laws in a way that is transparent and consultative. And we, uh, we were able to sign a letter of agreement with the Ministry of Public Security on collaboration in the judicial sector and in law enforcement. We were also able to uh, uh, agree on a partnership on climate change and how we were going to work together in climate change. And that builds on a lot of collaboration that we've had in both the Mekong and the Red River Deltas on, on uh, adaptation, mitigation of, of climate change effects. And we were able to provide support to Vietnam, which is dealing with an historic drought, particularly in the Mekong Delta. Uh, we were able to, to achieve two accomplishments in the area of nonproliferation. One is administrative arrangement under the 123 agreement on peaceful uses of nuclear energy, and then establishing a U.S.-Vietnam Joint Commission on civil nuclear cooperation. And then also in the field of global collaboration, we were able to very much enhance our collaboration under the global health security agenda. Uh, we achieved agreement with the Vietnamese on combating wildlife trafficking. There's a new, we have a new U.S.-Vietnam partnership on wildlife trafficking. Uh, and actually a couple of other agreements as well. Uh, the FATCA, the Foreign uh, Accounting Tax Compliance Act. Um, and we have, uh, after 20 years of trying, uh, we finally have a site to build a new embassy. Uh, so I had told the, the, uh, the staff about a year ago that if we were really ambitious and we went full out for 12 what I like to call joint endeavors. Uh, this is an idea that um, I, I learned from a, a great mentor, Cameron Hume. I'm very happy he's here today. That if we went full out, if we were absolutely uh, directed and ambitious and we had good strategies and we, follow, we pursued 12 different joint endeavors, if we were really lucky, we might be able to get seven or maybe eight across the finish line in time for the president's visit. And we got 20. Uh, so what that tells me is that the Vietnamese were ready. They're ready to collaborate with us across the board in all of these different areas. Uh, they wanted the president to come and visit. They ensured that the visit was successful. Uh, and they made some difficult decisions when it came to some of these agreements. Some of these agreements were, were, uh, were challenging for the Vietnamese. Uh, and they went ahead with them. Uh, and this is a, a fairly new government, but they, they went ahead. Uh, they, we dragged some of these agreements right over the finish line just in time for the visit. And what it tells me is that we have a really solid foundation uh, for the next 50, 60 years of the relationship if we're able to successfully implement all of these decisions that were, that were made. Uh, so it gives me great optimism for the relationship, I believe there's, there's lots more that we can do uh, in, the next, in the next 
few years while I'm there, and then I hope in the next 50, 60, 70 years uh, in the relationship. And with that, I am very happy to take whatever questions you might like to, to pose. Great. Uh, thanks, Ambassador Osius. I, I think everybody probably agrees that you had a you managed uh, a very successful trip, so congratulations. Thank uh, you. I think, yeah, a lot of people thought you'd get part of it, but to get all of that, that's great. Now, there are three, two or three things happened that weren't in the communique uh, that I just want to ask you a bit about. Sure. Uh, one is, uh, you know, the president wanted to see some, some uh, human rights, democracy activists, whatever you want to call them, and uh, some of them didn't show up for the meeting. Um, can you tell us a little bit what happened? Uh, secondly, uh, with regard to Fulbright University, uh, the, um, uh, there's been a bit of a kerfuffle over, over Senator Bob Kerry and his role as the chairman of the fundraising board for, for Fulbright University, which I think everybody would agree is a great, is a great opportunity for Vietnam. Yeah. And then the third thing, which I saw some chatter about on the Vietnamese social media, is the temple that the president visited. Uh, they have, okay. People say it was a Chinese temple, not a Vietnamese temple. What, what right. was the deal with that? <laughs> thank you. <laughs> uh, first on the, thank you, thank you, Murray. First on the civil society event, um, no sitting US president or any other world leader, for, as far as I know, has, uh, while making an official trip to Vietnam, sat down with representatives of civil society. Uh, and in the end, he didn't sit down with as many representatives uh, as I had recommended. Um, but in the end, the meeting happened. And the uh, president was very clear in his public remarks about the fact that he was disappointed that he didn't get to meet with everybody. But he was very happy to meet with those whom he did uh, get to talk to. And it was a very, for me, a very real, revealing discussion. Uh, the, the members of civil society with whom we met had some really concrete proposals for things that we could do going forward. And um, we have a work cut out for us uh, to, uh, to see what we, can, what, what we can implement in terms of their recommendations. Uh, the president is very committed to engaging with members of civil society wherever he goes. And we had made the point to Vietnamese leadership, this is not different from other countries. This is what he does in every country. Uh, and it was too bad that they didn't see it as in their interest to have him meet with everybody. It would have been, uh, it, it would have been a non-event if he'd met with everybody, but they didn't. And in the end, it is their country and their, their decisions. Uh, uh, and so he met with most of the people he intended to meet with, but not everybody. Uh, the second one was Fulbright University. Bob Carey. Uh, I will, I think I'd like to share with you a fact and a couple of opinions. The fact is that Fulbright University of Vietnam is independent. Its board is not cho chosen by the United States government. It is not chosen by the government of Vietnam. Uh, and that's a good thing. Uh, the second opinion I'd like to offer is that the debate that has taken place uh, since the license was granted and, and former Senator Kerry went to, to Ho Chi Minh City to receive the license, the de debate that has taken place is a healthy one. It's the reason we want to have a Fulbright University, so that there can be healthy debates like that about the past and about what kind of a future Vietnam wants to have. So I look at that vibrant debate on, over, over this issue as a really positive sign. I'm glad to see that kind of a debate. And then I'm going to offer one other opinion. I have been engaging with the government and the people of Vietnam for over 20 years now. And Nowhere in the world are people more forward-looking and more forgiving than in Vietnam. They, they are extraordinary. When you think about the past relationship we have, we, we've had, and the, the kind of commitment that there is to building this new partnership, Vietnamese people are incredibly forward-looking and incredibly forgiving. And I think that will be, uh, in the end, uh, what, what will happen is the Vietnamese people will look forward and they will be forgiving. Uh, the last one was... Temple, the Chinese temple. Oh, the temple. Yes. Uh, <laughs> yes. There was a lot of noise about the temple just before the visit. And as far as I'm concerned, I, I didn't hear any noise after he went. Um, it, was a very, it was a very nice touristic visit to a beautiful traditional temple where many, many Vietnamese go to worship every day. It's a hundred-year-old temple, 
beautiful place. The president liked it. Uh, those who explained the history of the temple enjoyed meeting with the president, showing him around. And something interesting happened that um, I don't think was ever reported in the press. After the president's visit to the temple, and I was with him, and we went out and got into the, the motorcade afterwards. Right after the president visited, the abbot of the temple took the big gates of the temple and closed them. And the reason he did that, and this is, I, th I think this is uh, sort of Taoist philosophy. He wanted the, the energy, the positive energy that the president had brought to the temple to stay there and to mingle with the spirits that were in the temple. And, that, and this is a, a, rare, a rare and unusual and kind of a beautiful thing. He wanted that, that powerful, good energy to remain there in the temple. After he closed the gates, citizens from the neighborhood came to the temple and they prostrated themselves in front of those gates. That is also a rare thing. It might happen when an emperor visits a temple. It might happen when a holy man like the Dalai Lama visits the temple. It happened after Barack Obama <laughs> visited the temple. So to me, there was, this, was a, this was a good visit. It was a good visit. It was respected by people in the neighborhood. And this came in the context of, I will never forget riding in that motorcade, because everywhere we went in Ho Chi Minh City, if you turned a corner, the, the crowds would be 30 people deep. All the way out to the airport, they were at least a dozen people deep. And the president said, he, you know, with the possible exception of Tanzania, he had never seen a, a bigger crowds turn out for his motorcade. He was really struck by the warmth that, uh, the warm welcome that he received in Ho Chi Minh City, and I was too, and I was with Bill Clinton when he went to Ho Chi Minh City uh, almost 20 years ago. I've never seen anything like this. It was, it was really phenomenal. So we'll open it up to questions. Um, so wait for a microphone. Please introduce yourself and try to ask a question, please. Over here, please. Hi, uh, I'm Angelina Huynh uh, from the Vietnamese pro-democracy organization called Viet Thanh. So, um, well, the trip was such, brought so much inspiration to the Vietnamese people. Uh, thank you so much. So I have a question, uh, Ambassador. Uh, moving forward, what leverage do you see uh, the U.S. have to press for more human rights improvement? Uh, I think we have about the same as we did before the visit, which is quite a lot, and more when we engage than if we don't engage. Uh, that does not mean that we can dictate decisions that are, are made by the Vietnamese government. Uh, what it means is that uh, on issues where we disagree, and in the, in the area of human rights is where we have the, the biggest, most open disagreements, that we can have a respectful dialogue, and sometimes we can come to meeting of the minds. The president raised in every single meeting human rights and the importance of addressing concerns about human rights if our partnership is to reach its fullest potential, and if Vietnam is to reach its fullest potential. Every meeting, and every meeting we had uh, a respectful and good dialogue. And in every meeting, he raised the issue of systemic change, not just letting a prisoner of, uh, a prisoner of concern out of jail, but the kind of changes that I was talking about that are enshrined in the in the joint statement, legal change, changes to the law and religion and belief, changes to the law and association to reflect a, a forward-looking new constitution. Because with those kinds of systemic changes, it won't be one prisoner comes out, another one goes in right behind him or her. Uh, so on the, I think part of what you're, you're alluding to is the fact that the lethal weapons ban uh, was lifted. And the decision to lift the lethal weapons ban, I'm going to pull back for a moment. When we had a contentious relationship with India, we had to do something hard, which was come to agreement over uh, civil nuclear issues that had divided us for a long time. It was difficult, but it allowed our relationship to move forward. In Indonesia, we had to come to agreement over the role of Kapasas. That was difficult took a long time, but allowed our relationship to go forward. This was the last big obstacle to a, a normalized relationship. It was a kind of a, a stigma. 
It was a discrimination uh, that had been enshrined in the 1960s. Things were quite different. And the president made a decision to take away that obstacle, to fully normalize the relationship, not because that would suddenly transform the human rights scene, it won't, but uh, because we still have tools, we still have leverage when it comes to human rights, including case-by-case decision-making over weapon systems. And we have, I think even more importantly, this broad and increasingly deep partnership where we are engaging with the Vietnamese on everything across the board and where, where we have respectful dialogue on everything, including human rights. Uh, so I think we have just as much as we did before, pr probably more, because we have a deeper and stronger partnership. Ted, do you want to? Oh, yeah, thanks. Things? Thank you. Please, sir. This gentleman here. Okay. I'm Chip Barber from the World Resources Institute. Good to see you. Um, a question about uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership and illegal logging. Uh, as, as you know, one of the environmental criticisms for about the ratification has been about that, and a lot about Peru, but a lot about Vietnam as well, because of all the timber coming from Laos and Cambodia. Can we use this opportunity of both the TPP and what came out of this visit to work with the Vietnamese to try and close down that big highway of, of rosewood and other wood that's going through Vietnam into China? Thank you. Well, I think we can for a couple of reasons. Uh, for one, TPP has the strongest environmental provisions ever in an international agreement. In fact, if the environmental chapter alone were considered, it would be one of the strongest environmental agreements ever reached. Uh, so the TPP helps. Uh, but we've also got this new climate change partnership. And we also have a much deeper relationship as a result of this visit uh, with the Ministry of Public Security on law enforcement. And this is a law enforcement issue, uh, as well as an environmental issue. So I think we have the a basis on which to work much more closely with the Vietnamese uh, on this challenge. Please. Hi, Marisa Lino with Northrop Grumman. Good to see nice you. Nice to see you again. Uh, I wonder if you would address a topic that is on the minds of most US companies looking at Vietnam, and that is risk. Uh, whether it's uh, the risk of not being paid, whether it's uh, rule of law, corruption, uh, all of these questions that uh, revolve around the basic question of risk of doing business in Vietnam. Thank you. Well, one thing you have in Vietnam is stability in government. <laughs> there was a transition, but it was, you know, pretty predictable. Uh, <laughs> So if you're looking for st stability as a hedge against risk, I would say check. Uh, <laughs> but the other thing you have is a, a deepening commitment to rule of law. Our mantra, and I say it all the time, is we support a strong, prosperous, independent Vietnam that respects human rights and the rule of law. And we have a very, uh, we, very good response to that mantra, always. There are two halves of it. Uh, and the, the response is, is good to both, both halves of it. The commitment now is to enhancing rule of law. The National Assembly, which when I first went to Vietnam 20 years ago was a rubber stamp, is not. I guarantee it is not a rubber stamp anymore. Ministries are afraid. They know they're going to be called up and called to account before the National Assembly. The, the new chair of the National Assembly is very dynamic, very committed to strengthening rule of law, strengthening the role of the judiciary, uh, making sure that the judiciary is more independent. And so I think the trends are good. It doesn't mean that every individual company is going to have immediately a good experience. Uh, and there are, there are companies that do their investments out of Singapore because they know that rule of law is stronger in Singapore, and that's a reasonable business decision. But I think the Vietnamese look at those decisions and realize there are great advantages. If you want to boost investment, if you want to enhance trade, there are great advantages to strengthening rule of law. And so that's what they're busily doing. It's, it's, a, it's a systematic process that they're, they're uh, rewriting their laws in order to reflect their their 2013 constitution. So the commitment is there, it's deep, and the role of business is very important in 
in, uh, as these laws are being rewritten and developed, the role of business is, uh, uh, is important and, and business is listened to. This is uh, uh, the new government as well as the previous government are both committed to hearing, business, hearing out the business community and their concerns. And they certainly make it clear to me every time I go in and advocate uh, for a uh, position or for something that USABC or AmpCham or the chamber here uh, have advocated that they're listening. Doesn't mean we always win the battles right away. Sometimes it takes, it takes time and patience. But I think the trends are all good. Please. You're, you, sir. <laughs> I'm Ed Gerwin. I'm the uh, senior trade fellow with the Progressive Policy Institute. We hear a lot uh, in Washington about labor rights in Vietnam generally and in the context of TPP. Uh, you are very well known for traveling around the country and really connecting with Vietnam and its people. Could you give us a sense of what is happening uh, with labor and labor rights in Vietnam now and what you anticipate to happen if TPP were to come into force? Um, well, one of the things that's happening now is that there are a lot of wildcat strikes. Uh, I think there were, in one year there were 10,000. And wildcat strikes are harder to deal with because if you're a business manager, you, you know, if you were working with a, a union, then you have somebody across the table with, with whom you can resolve challenges. So when we started, uh, in the TPP negotiations, uh, pushing for independent unions, there were a lot of people within the party and the government who saw this as advantageous, saw it as a good idea. Now, we were hard bargainers, and I think we got a very good deal on, in the uh, labor compliance, uh, labor consistency plan, which is a, a side letter to the TPP, but, but is fully enforceable. Uh, we got a good agreement, and now, um, now the new government and the new head of the VGCL are, are uh, coming to grips with what have they've committed to. And I don't think it's, the, the process will be easy, but I think the political will is absolutely there to com complying fully with what Vietnam agreed to in TPP, especially in, on the labor provisions. One of the things that's happening right now is that there's this program called Better Work Vietnam that is really fantastic. It's in more and more factories each year. And it's, it's auditing, it's, it's sharing of best practices. Uh, it is a terrific program. And I visited a number of these Better Work Vietnam factories. And you can see the impact that that program is, is having. And I, wanna, I, I think in the lead up to uh, implementation of TPP, that uh, boosting the role of Better Work Vietnam is, is, would be really advantageous to everybody. And everybody's comfortable with it. Uh, the, other, the other institution with which everybody's comfortable is the ILO. And the standards that, were, that TPP asks Vietnam to adhere to are not American standards or TPP standards, they're ILO standards. And the ILO has tremendous credibility in Vietnam. So we work very, very closely uh, with the ILO and have done so as we design our technical assistance program. So what I think will happen is that uh, we'll see either in July or in, or in October uh, ratification of TPP by the National Assembly. And then they're going to start systematically and occasionally slowly moving towards implementation. Uh, but they'll do that in partnership with us, with other TPP members, and with the private sector because the private sector has lots to gain from full implementation of, the of all of the TPP commitments and particularly the labor commitments. Elizabeth, do you? Thank you, Elizabeth Becker, author and journalist. Um, you mentioned that Vietnam is forward looking and also forgiving and you also mentioned that you're cleaning up the president agreed to clean up Da Nang and other hot spots. Are there any other areas that you consider important for the United States to consider in cleaning up any um, remaining war damage? Yes. Um, we started 20 years ago. We were able, 20, really starting 25 years ago, we were able to build trust by working together on the MIA issue. And when I first went to Vietnam and worked with Mike and others there, um, we were able to go anywhere 
we asked on a moment's notice to follow up any lead. That was the kind of transparency that the Vietnamese provided so that we could achieve the fullest possible accounting of those whom we'd lost. And now that collaboration has gone further and we are able to share information with the Vietnamese that we have that helps them to do a, a fuller accounting of those whom they have lost. And we're able to share expertise. And so that has been, that uh, is, was also discussed uh, at, at some length during the President's visit. And it's an area of collaboration that we're going to continue, that is going to uh, keep going forward until we have the fullest possible accounting of those whom we lost. We've, been, we've spent about $92 million in the last decade on cleaning up unexploded ordnance. And we've had some great successes. People may not know that uh, 10 times more ordnance was dropped on Vietnam during the war than on all of Europe during World War II. And that's small country. Uh, so there's a lot of ordnance to be cleaned up. The worst, the province that was worst hit was Quang Tri. Uh, I've spent a lot of time in Quang Tri, both <laughs> biking and walking and uh, meeting with people. And we are having some extraordinary successes in cleaning up unexploded ordnance in Quang Tri. I predict that it will be impact free. No more kids will lose their limbs. No more farmers uh, will, will lose their lives by 2020 or 2022. That's, that's what we're headed for because we have been able to bring all the civil society organizations together to work with the Ministry of National Defense and to work with provincial officials in a completely transparent fashion to clean up Quang Tri so that no one has to fear the unexploded ordinance there. And what we're going to do is replicate that model in neighboring provinces so that we, I believe, the next one could be Ha Tin or Tua Tien Hue. Those officials have told me that they're very anxious to replicate the Quang Tri model and they'd like to work with us. So that's a, another area where I think we have really good collaboration. The toughest one is cleaning up Bien Hoa because it's such a big challenge. It's five times larger than the hotspot at Da Nang. It will be more expensive. Uh, but we've committed to a partnership. We're going to work with the Vietnamese to figure out what is the best way to do it. It will be a Vietnamese-led operation. I'm certain of that. And we will contribute uh, as, best, as best we can. We have a, the highest level commitment to contribute to that process. And then there's the final, uh, final issue, and not a small one, is what about the victims of Agent Orange? And what we do now already is we provide assistance to persons with disabilities in 10 provinces. They happen to be the 10 provinces that were most affected by dioxin, uh, regardless of cause. And so we're doing a lot of work in the area of disabilities. Uh, I think ultimately we'll need to do more. Sir, Frontier Bed. I'm Glenn Fukushima with the Center for American Progress. Good to see you again. Um, <clears throat> I'm very pleased to learn about the, uh, the joint statement and all the progress that you've made. But uh, obviously, in any kind of a joint statement, there's a negotiation that leads to the joint statement. So I'd like to know if you could let us know maybe three or four areas in which the U.S. wanted to achieve but was not able to achieve in this particular uh, joint statement, which you know, areas that we might expect in the future there might be additional progress on. <clears throat> Thanks. Uh, well, I think we got everything we needed to get out of the joint statement. I was very happy with the results. Um, one of the negotiators is in the room, and we were prepared if we didn't, weren't able to get the kind of statement that we wanted, not to have a joint statement, but we have one. Uh, the area that still divides us is the area of human rights. Um, we, I think Murray invited Ambassador Vin to come today. We've, We've appeared together before a, a couple of times in Washington. I love it when we appear together uh, because so very often we can finish each other's sentences. We're on the same page when it comes to most of what we're doing. We're not on the same page when it comes to human rights. We still have work to do in that area, but the trends are good. The trends continue to be good when it comes to religious freedom, treatment of persons with disabilities, LGBT persons, uh, the, the trends are good, and I think those trends will continue in a, in a positive direction. Please, over here. Uh, 
Hi, Angel Sinakli. I'm an undergraduate student at the Elliott School of International Affairs. Um, based on uh, President Obama's recent trip to Vietnam, he remarked that the lifting of the arms embargo was not based on China. But based on your experiences in Vietnam, how does the Vietnamese government and the people uh, feel about China's recent actions in the South China Sea? Thank you. Well, the people of Vietnam are not happy with the actions that the Chinese are taking in the South China Sea. They see them as, as belligerent, uh, unilateral, and uh, disrespectful of international law. And this is an area where we and Vietnam, uh, where our views are pretty damn close uh, on respect for international law, on the uh, importance of not using force. You'll see in the joint statement uh, commitment to non-militarization of the features in the South China Sea. And um, I think there's very little question but that Chinese actions have pushed some of the Southeast Asian nations closer to the United States. So it's up to the Chinese to con you know, continue making a calculus about whether this, the, the actions that they've taken in the South China Sea are wise or in their long-term interest. Uh, that's not a, a decision that we can make. It's a decision that Chinese have to make. Uh, in my view, um, we shouldn't make it easy for the for the Chinese to, to behave unilaterally and in, with disregard for international law in the South China Sea. Sorry, we haven't really recognized people on this side. Uh, Linda? I'm Linda Yara, George Washington University. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, would you kindly uh, elaborate a bit more on the, US, on the Joint Commission on Nuclear Cooperation? What will be its brief, its membership, and what can we look forward to about it? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. You know, I was asked this question yesterday, and I should have done some research because I didn't know the answer yesterday, and I don't know today. Uh, and I apologize, but I'm not going to make it up. Uh, it was one of the, the achievements that was sort of at the last minute we were able to come to agreement on this joint commission. Uh, I know that it was, it was prompted by our determination, the determination of both sides to collaborate much more on civil nuclear energy. But uh, yesterday I was asked um, whether it will have public members or, or members of the uh, uh, business community, and I actually don't know the answer, and I apologize. It is, there is a fact sheet that's on the White House website that will explain its makeup, I, and I have, <laughs> have not yet read that fact sheet. Uh, <laughs> mea culpa, uh, my, my fault, I should have. Uh, but uh, it's, it's an indication of how serious we are about developing that collaboration. The President and the Prime Minister talked about civil nuclear cooperation, and I think the President and uh, President Kwang also talked about civil nuclear cooperation. Uh, President Obama wrote a letter before the visit uh, to the Prime Minister, and the Prime Minister was able to answer uh, when they met. The, the, what the, uh, answer the question that the president had raised in that letter. So I see we have a very good dialogue, uh, and it'll only be a better dialogue with the establishment of this commission, and I wish I knew how it was made up, but I don't. Sorry. See, there was a, Jackie. My name is Jackie Chagnon, and I'm with War Legacies Project. Um, I'm particularly working in, in Laos and what affects Vietnam also often affects Laos as well as Cambodia, as did the Vietnam War. Um, my question is in relationship to what Elizabeth was talking about. Um, the post-war consequences are still being lived with in all three of those countries. And I think you've made some very good moves in Vietnam recently with the cleanups. But the uh, Ho Chi Minh Trail ran also through Laos and, Viet and Cambodia, and it was heavily sprayed as well as bombed. I haven't seen any action by the U.S. government on that yet, and I'm wondering if somehow, with your influence in Vietnam, if you could persuade our government to do a little bit more to help the victims inside Laos who are experiencing very similar uh, problems with uh, diseases, congenital diseases. So give me, give me your ideas, please. Uh, well, I'm not the ambassador to Laos, uh, <laughs> but what I would say is the president's going to Laos in September, so stay tuned. 
there will, there will, there's been no hesitancy on the part of this president to face our past squarely. And I don't see any reason there would be suddenly in the next couple of months a reversal of that approach. He has been very direct about uh, facing the consequences of our past in Indochina, and I would expect the same uh, during his trip to Laos. Question over here. Hello, Mr. Ambassador. My name is Fong. I'm a CSIS intern with the Asia Maritime Transparency Initiative. And I'm also a Vietnamese citizen as well. So um, my question is, so recently, uh, Secretary uh, Carter visited India. And he said that India and, um, and the United States would joint, have a joint uh, patrol in Southeast, uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, but then after that, India said, no, we're not going to do it. And then at the same time, uh, China is doing the same thing similarly, uh, trying to get to the same position by uh, other countries from Africa to Eastern Europe, supporting their position in South China Sea. So as we can see, this further internationalization of this conflict, so if you can uh, talk a little bit on the downside of this and what the United States can do to help Vietnam to walk on this further delicate line between Vietnam, China, Vietnam, United States, and uh, how to reintegrate uh, ASEAN in this particular conflict. Thank you. Well, well, Vietnam has a challenge, which is how do you balance relations with uh, the great powers? And Vietnam has a very powerful nation on its northern border with which it wants to have the best relations possible. And we're very respectful of that. Uh, India has an interest in keeping the peace on the seas, whether it's the Indian Ocean or further east. It's, it's in India's interest. And like in, like in many nations, navies tend to be kind of more forward-looking, more outward-looking than other parts of the military. And so the Indian Navy has, has, uh, uh, has shown an interest in greater collaboration with us. When that, you know, how that will be implemented, I would defer to the, our, our ambassador to India. Uh, but what I would say is that when it comes to Southeast Asia and it comes to dealing with the challenges in the South China Sea, what's really good for us is to have strong, respectful, and powerful partnerships. And India is one, Indonesia is another, Vietnam is a third. These are, these are partnerships where it's in our interest that our partners uh, have the capability to know what's happening in their waters, uh, have the uh, the best possible capacity to be able to deal with the challenge, and that we look at the diplomatic aspects of the challenge in similar ways. We have had a lot of discussions with Vietnam about how to maintain a united ASEAN, and how to maintain an ASEAN that focuses in a constructive way on this issue. And the, you know, a test will come when the arbitral tribunal finally releases its decision uh, on the case that the Philippines sent to The Hague. And it would be best if ASEAN were to respond in a unified fashion to that decision. And that is certainly what Vietnam would like to see. It's what we'd like to see. Uh, but in the end, it'll be up to the ASEAN members how they react. But that is a very important part of the strategy. It can't be just a security strategy. It can't be just a legal strategy. It also needs, there also needs to be a very strong diplomatic strategy. And in my view, that must have ASEAN at its center. So the president hosted uh, members of ASEAN at Sunnylands this spring. Uh, he's about to make his 11th trip to, to the region for, in his presidency when he goes to Laos. Uh, he has shown his commitment to strengthening ASEAN and strengthening our relations within ASEAN. Uh, and I, uh, I think that's a good way to go if you want to have an effective diplomatic strategy. Ambassador, I'm going to jump in here and ask a yeah. question that uh, we got asked a lot during the president's visit here at CSS. And one was, uh, uh, so now that the ban's been lifted, what's Vietnam going to buy? Uh, do, do you have any hunches? And because uh, they, they, the ban was partially lifted two years ago, and not, there's some, been some window shopping, but not a lot of hard buying. Secondly, uh, what the heck's going to happen at Kamran Bay? There's a lot of speculation that the president was going to get some agreement to have basing rights, and we all know that's a bit far-fetched, but what do you think is the possibility at Kamran Bay? Thanks. 
Um, first on what Vietnam is going to buy. Uh, I would imagine that the first items that Vietnam should, will seek from us will be those that will help it in the realm of maritime security. So we've uh, received a couple of letters of request from the Vietnamese military. Uh, there may be more coming. Uh, they're not going to suddenly come rushing in. There's not going to be a sudden turn. You know, oh, we want to you know, buy out the store. It's not going to happen. This will be slow and deliberate. And the Vietnamese, I'm certain, will make their decisions uh, based on what they, what they consider from a strategic standpoint to be uh, their best, the best options that they can choose. And it won't be sudden. It won't be any, any, uh, anybody who, who thinks that, that there will suddenly be an outpouring of spending is wrong. It's going to take a while. And our systems uh, for, for procurement are complicated. Uh, the Vietnamese are still learning how those systems work. We've had two defense industry symposia in Vietnam. The first one we hosted, the second one we co-hosted with the Ministry of National Defense. So the process of learning is going on. And uh, there's interest in co-production, as we uh, put in the uh, joint vision statement that Secretary Carter and his then counterpart issued, I think it was last June. Uh, and so I think there are gonna be, there's going to be a systematic approach to, uh, to weapons procurement, and it's going to be a slow, patient, step-by-step -step approach. And so we ought to be patient and work step-by-step -step, uh, through that. On, the, on, the, on Cameron Bay, um, there's been a lot of fulminating in the press about Cameron Bay, and some of the fulminating has absolutely no basis in reality. Uh, and some of the articles I've looked at, I have had to wonder, you know, what planet are, are, are people living on? We respect Vietnam's policy of three no's. That's no basing, no alliances, no use of our territory to go after somebody else. Uh, Deputy Secretary Blinken, when he went to Vietnam just before the president, put it, said in his speech, we do not seek bases in Vietnam. We don't want bases in Vietnam. Uh, Maybe it would be helpful if I were clear about what there is at Cameron Bay. There are a couple of different facilities there. There's one that's an international port. It's a fee-for-service facility. Anybody can use that facility. I think at th to this point, there have only been two countries that have taken advantage of it, Singapore and Japan, who have brought their ships in. It's a place where you can have a sh your ships refueled. They can be repaired. It's fee for service. And I would expect that we will take advantage of that facility. If the terms are good, if the, you know, the cost is right, we can get the services that we want, uh, when, that, when that facility is, is more ready than it is right now. There's a second facility, uh, which is a restricted naval base. And there is zero expectation that we would have access to that restricted naval base. Zero expectation that we would have a rotating presence in Cameron Bay, or a base in Cameron Bay, zero. Uh, and so I, I think it's better to put the, some of the fulminating to rest, because it's not based <laughs> in reality. There's a question over there, ma'am. Um, good afternoon. My name's Jasmine Shi, And um, in May 2014, because of the anti-China activities, a lot of people uh, who owned factory in Taiwan had it to be um, rescued because they're lumped into the whole anti-China um, activity. And personally, I think that uh, Taiwan should be a really good ally with Vietnam for trades and for um, border security, if you will, and to um, maybe uh, secure or defense against um, China because there's a very interesting uh, relationship over there. I would just say that what is your view and what is U.S.'s plan to support China and um, Taiwan, especially with a new president uh, there in relationship with um, Vietnam? Because it's actually a very critical growing relationship, you know, and then, of course, a uh, step into Cambodia. But I know that's not your uh, emphasis. Thank you. Um, the, the, the riots that took place and the burning of vehicles and the burning of factories that took place uh, occurred right after uh, China placed an oil rig in Vietnam's exclusive economic zone. And so they were, the sort of spontaneous outbursts 
were anti-Chinese, and they did not distinguish between Taiwanese Chinese and mainland Chinese. And uh, they did distinguish between American companies and Chinese companies, and any car that drove through with an American flag was untouched. Uh, and so there was, a, there was an anti-Chinese outpouring that was not contained. And it's actually one of the reasons, I think, that uh, Vietnam became more receptive to this idea of independent trade unions. Because if you have trade unions that actually do collective bargaining and that deal with the concerns that workers have, then when you have something unexpected that happens, you have leaders you can go to who can talk to the members of their trade unions and calm them down and say, here's how we will address your concerns, or uh, here are the limits that we have. But you have empowered leaders that can uh, help avoid violence. Uh, so I would say the, the best thing to do is to implement the, commitment, the labor commitments that have been made under TPP if you want to avoid a repeat of something like that. Phuong? This is Phuong Ha from Bao Group Asia. So on the topic of uh, riots and protests, uh, you must have been aware that um, because of the fish kill in the central region of Vietnam, there have been uh, street protests, yes. which are uncommon in Vietnam. So um, did the, uh, the US embassy has any um, like conversation with the Vietnamese government about this? And uh, so what does the Vietnamese government have to say? And also about um, just your, um, your opinion about like, the risk for US business? About the what? For, uh, for the risks. Oh, risks. For, yeah, for US business um, operating in Vietnam about this situation. Thanks. Um, well, on the, the fish kill protests, well, what we did is pretty much right away, uh, I offered technical assistance from the United States, if the government of Vietnam wanted it, uh, for figuring out what had happened and what the source, what, the reason that so many fish had died along the central coast. Uh, and that uh, the sort of immediate offer of assistance was not accepted. Uh, but uh, there has been some collaboration between American scientists and Vietnamese scientists on trying to sort out the causes of the fish kill. Uh, it just wasn't a, a, as a result of our, our official offer. Uh, when it came to the protests, uh, you know, it's our... It's, it's our view that there's nothing, that peaceful protests are a good thing. Uh, but we are not engaged in this issue in any way. We're not, this is, this is an internal issue uh, to Vietnam. We can encourage the Vietnamese government to deal with protests in a certain way, but it's not our call in the end. It's the decision, it'll be decisions made by the Vietnamese government and the Vietnamese people about how to deal uh, with protests when they occur. The law and association I, and the future, in future the law and assembly will be the laws that determine, best determine how those challenges are dealt with in the future. And we do have views on how those laws are, are written and formed and we'll make, we'll make our views known to the Vietnamese government on, on uh, uh, how, how we think it would be best for Vietnam to, to rewrite those laws. When it comes to risk, I mean, there's, no, there, there's nowhere in the world where, there, where you can invest and there will be zero risk. But when I think of, I've traveled around the country of Fairmount, thanks to, to Alex and USABC, uh, I've had a chance to travel around the United States a lot and talk to uh, business leaders about their interests in Southeast Asia. And, you know, when you look at a country that's got a, a fast-growing economy, uh, literate population, uh, wages are lower than in, in, the, uh, in some of the neighboring countries. It's a member, it will be a member of TPP. That becomes a pretty attractive option for, for a lot of companies. So I had, when, when we went around to, to those cities, a lot, I got a lot of questions. And I think it was really because Vietnam had made the, the courageous decision to join TPP, and some of its neighbors had not made that courageous decision. And it was a hard decision to make. They had, there were, the negotiations were tough. 
There were some uh, aspects of, of the agreement that were hard for the Vietnamese to, to take during the negotiations and will be hard to implement. But I think they, the Vietnam's leaders made a really courageous decision when they decided to use TPP to propel their economy forward, to, uh, to encourage reform, con encourage the continuation of reform. So again, I'm, a, I'm an optimist, but again, I think the trends are, are very good and the opportunities for American businesses, uh, I think in general, are quite good. Ambassador Osius, thank you very much. Uh, it was, uh, gave us a lot of granularity on the president's visit and uh, thank you very much for interrupting your vacation to come and talk to us. <laughs> really appreciate it. Thanks, Dad. Thank you. Thank you.